Today on Missing Link. Where's the connection between ancient Egypt and modern data storage? And what does data storage have to do with butterflies? How are these fluttering insects linked to the weather? What does the weather have to do with telegraphy? There aren't any links? Oh yes there are. You just have to look really hard. Missing Link. Wealth and trade links made Egypt the jewel of the ancient world. Other great powers of the time viewed the country on the Nile with great envy. They wanted to conquer it. It's the year 1457 BC. A pharaoh, a legendary figure even today, is forced to defend his country. His name, Tutmosa III. Will he be able to protect his ancestors' legacy? The enemies of Egypt have joined forces, forming a vast army. Tutmosa III and his soldiers are setting out to fight a decisive battle. A battle they'll go on to win, and which will mark the dawn of Egyptian imperialism in Western Asia. Their destination? The city of Megiddo. Megiddo lies far from Egypt, but the region around the city is of enormous importance for the security of the pharaoh's empire. The rulers here were once held in Egypt's sway, but now the hostile kingdom of Mitanni has drawn the local kings onto its side. Tutmosa must crush the enemy alliance to protect his country from foreign rule. But the most important city in his realm is Thebes. Almost 30,000 people live in the capital city, which is home to the shrine of Amun-Ra, the most important temple in the land. Hundreds of priests worship Egypt's countless gods here every day. To them, Thebes is the center of the world. Even today, the ruins attest to the glory of the former capital. The gigantic buildings made of huge stones are covered in colorful paintwork. Stone reliefs describe the heroic deeds of the pharaohs, among them Tutmosa III. His biography starts at a time when Egypt's enemies were gaining strength. Egypt's neighbors have their sights set on the great wealth of the Nile state. Whereas their homelands are often ravaged by drought, the Egyptians enjoy regular and bountiful harvests. The fields along the Nile are incredibly fertile, and they support enough crops to feed all the citizens of the country. Rarely has a single river played such a major role in the power and wealth of a people. We live in an information society. Day after day, we produce unimaginable amounts of new data. But how can we store this data safely for future generations? and how a storage media connected to the ancient Egyptians. Not many things in this world grow as fast as the capacity of data storage media. 20 years ago, a typical hard disk could hold around 20 megabytes. Today, that's around two terabytes. In other words, today's hard drives are 100,000 times bigger. Developments in price are also interesting. Back then, a hard drive cost around $60. If the unit price had remained the same, then that two terabyte disk would now cost $6 million. This has made it pretty easy for us to store huge quantities of data. The ancient library of Alexandria held 70,000 scrolls that represented the sum of human knowledge at that time. If you were to digitize all that data, it would be a little over 70 terabytes or just about 35 hard disks. So considering how many hard drives are in circulation around the world, perhaps we need to ask ourselves whether our knowledge has grown at such an incredible rate 
or if we're doing with data what seems to come so naturally in other aspects of life. Producing rubbish. Digital trash. Scientists at the Fraunhofer Institute in Freiburg, Germany, recently made a sensational breakthrough that will set new standards in long-term data storage. They have managed to combine the durability of microfilm with the latest laser technology. This pioneering method allows them to record high-resolution color documents rapidly and accurately on microfilm, a technical masterpiece. The technology is the first of its kind, a color film that won't fade and will look like new even after a few hundred years. Data storage experts from libraries and archives are already queuing up for the new product. The Anna Amalia Library in Weimar is the first to benefit from the new technology. The inventory items that survived the devastating fire of 2004 are currently being copied, allowing them to be safely preserved for centuries, maybe even millennia, on microfilm sealed in airtight containers at the culture bunker near Freiburg. Let me put it bluntly. It's illusory to think that microfilm will allow us to store information for eternity. Under ideal conditions, microfilm can remain viable for about 400 years. Then you need to make a copy, and such copies are bound to have mistakes. You can make three successive copies from the original, which would make a total of 1,600 years. And then the information would be irretrievably lost. Scientists are constantly striving to extend the life of storage media. After all, what's 1600 years if we need to provide warnings about radioactive material with a half-life of 20,000 years? Or information about land mines and long-term toxic waste sites? Maybe these artificial crystals will provide the solution. They could prove to be the storage media of the future. The data transfer speeds far exceed any current technology and the capacity is equally impressive. Each crystal is equivalent to a thousand DVDs. Professor Cornelia Dentz of Münster University is investigating light as a data carrier. Large amounts of data can be written on the crystal at the speed of light, and they can be read at the same speed, and the crystals have yet another decisive advantage. It's a bit like when you fix a photographic print after developing it. You can fix the data in a crystal. And once that's been done, the data has a very long shelf life. Many of my colleagues have tested the fixing technique under very harsh conditions, and they concluded that the data would still be viable after at least a thousand years in a crystal storage medium. The basic principle they're pinning their hopes on is simple. The information is encoded in a laser beam. A prism splits the beam in two, and both parts are then joined again inside the crystal, fitting together perfectly to form a 3D hologram. The hologram contains the entire information transmitted in the laser beam. In holography, digital texts or images are transformed into a pattern of black and white squares that corresponds to the ones and zeros of the digital data. Data blocks composed of up to a million bits can thus be saved in one go. A convenient data storage medium with an unimaginable capacity and almost as long lasting as stone. Will storage crystals like this help us to pass down vital knowledge to our descendants in the far future? It's doubtful. The data in the crystals our warning messages about radiation, toxic waste or landmines will only be useful to future generations if they are able to decipher the digital software codes after thousands of years. Their populations in Europe are in critical decline. Biologists and environmentalists are deeply alarmed. Why are more and more of our butterflies disappearing? And how are these colourful insects and storage media connected? Yeah. 
butterflies are wonderful creatures. From an inconspicuous pupa emerges a magnificent animal that in the sunlight shimmers in beautiful colors. But where do all the colors come from? Certainly many butterflies do have color pigments for their wings, but what is it that makes them iridescent? Why do the colors glisten and change? Well, it has nothing to do with the pigmentation, but with the structure of the wings themselves. The white sunlight hits the fine ridges of the butterfly's wings and gets reflected back from the top and the bottom of the ridges. When these rays of light meet, some parts become lighter and other parts become darker. Physicists call this interference. It's this that allows the different parts of the sunlight to be seen, sometimes red, sometimes green, and sometimes blue, depending on the viewing angle. The butterfly shimmers in color. We can see this in CDs too. They also shimmer in color. That's due to the fine pattern within the CD which holds its digital data. Seen from a purely physical aspect, a butterfly is a CD of nature. Though we can't play back the tracks yet. Unsettling reports are spreading across the British Isles. And if they're correct, urgent action must be taken. Scientists have noticed that increasing numbers of butterflies are disappearing. And this trend can be observed in Germany too. It's crucial that we learn more about why our butterflies are in such sharp decline. Dr. Josef Settler of the Center for Environmental Research Leipzig Halle believes he's found a major cause for the decline of butterflies. But he needs more data, in particular about the migration habits of these insects. It's widely known that urban landscapes are increasingly encroaching on the butterfly's habitat. Can they still find their way through the asphalt jungle? And how is it possible to monitor the flight behavior of these sensitive creatures? At the University of Würzburg, biologists are studying locusts. The research is likewise focused on finding the best method of following the migration of these insects. The biologists carefully stick a special reflective film to the legs of the locusts. A tricky operation, the film has to be placed with utmost precision. Under no circumstances should the film hinder the insect's movements. Otherwise, the study would be doomed to failure from the outset. Every locust has a number on its special film, so it can be easily identified later on. Next, the scientists employ the latest GPS technology, which allows them to register the locations where the locusts set out on their journey. The test area is painstakingly measured and given clear markings. Then the insects are released from predetermined locations. It will be an exciting night for the scientists. Where have the locusts wandered since their release? They search for the insects using torches. The highly reflective film reveals the insect's location in light beams. In daylight, it would be impossible to relocate these well-camouflaged creatures. The scientists measure the distance the insects have covered since their release. They record all the data later for a computer analysis. It's a complex, laborious undertaking. Nonetheless, it proves possible to document the movements of the locusts over short periods. However, it becomes clear that this method isn't suitable for such delicate insects as butterflies. Their wings are covered in fine scales that split light beams into many colors. They are masterpieces of natural design. Pigmented scales protect the fragile wing membrane. But butterfly wings are actually not as fragile as many people think. And that's something Dr. Settler is able to exploit. The method is as simple as it's brilliant. Using a waterproof pen, he marks the butterfly's wings and then records their starting point. It takes practice to hold a butterfly with tweezers without injuring it. 
settler hopes that he or his staff will come across this butterfly again somewhere. And with every insect they find again, their knowledge about their movements will increase. It's obvious that butterflies that only cover small distances are especially endangered when more and more of their habitat is destroyed. The Center for Environmental Research Leipzig Halle and Friends of the Earth Germany have therefore begun a unique campaign to save the butterflies. It's a nationwide butterfly monitoring scheme involving a public butterfly count and a nationwide competition for children and adults. At a lab in Geneva, scientists are creating artificial rain. That's why they're called the Rainmakers. But what's the link between the weather and butterflies? People have always been interested in how the weather is going to be, which is why we've made a whole science out of the topic. It should be noted, though, that the predicted accuracy, despite satellite pictures, innumerable measuring equipment and super-huge computers, is still pretty mediocre. Why is this? Well, the reason is that atmospheric processes are not linear stable ones, but are chaotic. Stable processes are ones that allow a clear prediction. If a plant pot falls from a balcony, it will land below the balcony on the ground. Predictable beyond doubt. Repeating the experiment from the neighbor's balcony produces a similar result. In science talk, conduct an experiment with small changes to the initial conditions and get very similar results. It means you have a stable system. With weather, this is not the case. There, the smallest changes to the initial conditions can yield wildly different results. This is called the butterfly effect. A butterfly beating its wings, causing minute turbulence, can ultimately influence the whole atmosphere. Put another way, the beating of a butterfly's wings can trigger a hurricane. But it needn't. A system with such poor or lack of predictability is called chaotic. So the next time you have to pump 30 centimeters of overcast to cloudy out of your cellar, spare a thought for the butterfly and the poor weather. Ludger Verster is working on something that has only existed in science fiction films up to now. The physics professor is aiming to make rain out of light using laser beams. At the heart of the experiment is a cloud chamber that's cooled to the required temperature with liquid nitrogen. The cloud chamber creates ideal conditions for droplets to form. The laser is there to stimulate them because the droplets need to be triggered, just like in a real cloud. Verster's team is trying to achieve this with a laser. And it works. Tiny droplets have formed within the fine laser beam. We have seen it works. We've seen that it works. We're overjoyed that we succeeded under lab conditions. But now we have to take it to the next important step. We have to leave the confines of the lab and repeat the procedure out in the open. Will it work out there too? Or is it just wishful thinking? The site of the experiment, Geneva. First to construct a mobile monitoring station with his Swiss colleagues. For the first time ever, they plan to test the behavior of the laser in real weather conditions. We're hoping that it won't rain and we'll do our best not to produce a major downpour ourselves. All we're aiming for is to carry out our measurements here. It's a very exciting moment for us. The world's first ever mobile ultra-short laser is housed inside this container. It emits more energy than all of Europe's power stations combined, but only for a fraction of a billionth of a second. The scientists have to adjust it with great precision so that it can fully release its concentrated beam of light. The enormous amount of energy produced is directed using an elaborate system of mirrors. 
Dieser Spiegel ist nun der Spiegel, der das Licht unseres Lasers aus dem Container auf unsere Experimentierstrecke lenkt. Das heißt, wir schicken das hier hinaus in die Atmosphäre, um dann dorthin, wo der Analyse das zu analysieren, was das Licht in der Atmosphäre bewirkt. Now all they can do is wait. Because the experiment can only be made visible once it gets dark. This unusual project is a cooperation between German and Swiss scientists. Ludger Wurster would be lost without the help of experts from Geneva University. Stefano Laser, now the moment has arrived. Geram, attention, laser on. Barely visible to the naked eye, the ultra-short laser beam shines into the night. It transmits pulses of light in the range of terawatts. Incredibly powerful and incredibly short. In order to analyze the effects of the laser more closely, the scientists have to capture it. And, just like in the cloud chamber, Tiny water droplets have formed within the laser beam in the open air too. When such things Situations like this are really pure. emotional for us. And it's the emotional it's buzz that really drives us on. The enthusiasm for something the creates the idea and that stimulates your imagination. When, so when we see something like this, it's a feeling of elation. But despite their enthusiasm, it will take many years before Wuster's dream of producing artificial rain becomes a reality. The wireless radio, a milestone in the history of mankind. Marconi is considered the pioneer of this technology. But what does telegraphy have to do with the weather? Telegraphy is all about getting information as quickly as possible from one point to another, an art that's available to everyone today. And it's possible just about everywhere, thanks to the mobile phone. But it hasn't always been the case. In olden times, time-critical information was carried by runners or by horse riders. For the Prussian king Friedrich Wilhelm III, this was much too slow, and he decided to install an up-to-date system that had been introduced from France in 1830. The system was called an optical telegraph, and this is how it worked. Along the 550 kilometer long route from Berlin to Cologne, 62 telegraph stations were built. On the roof of each station was a mast equipped with movable arms. These could be moved to represent the letters of the alphabet. Using a telescope, the observers at the next telegraph station watched and then replicated the movement on their mast. The information could trundle from Berlin to Cologne and on to Koblenz. If everything went to plan, it took just a couple of minutes for a character to complete its journey. Unless, that is, there was fog or driving snow. Visibility gone, data stream collapses. Back then, it was the weather that was decisive as to whether the news arrived or not. The Dover Coast Guard monitors shipping in the English Channel around the clock. All ships in the Dover Strait, this is Dover Coast Guard. For a Four to five hundred ships cross the channel every day. They receive constant radio updates warning them of dangers, especially after there's been a dangerous accident. Marine radio is indispensable to these seafaring giants. They keep in constant contact with coastal stations and other ships wherever they are on the seven seas. But 120 years ago, captains on the high seas had no radios and had to cope with emergencies on their own. London at the end of the 19th century. Great Britain is the most powerful seafaring nation of the time, and it's building on its dominant position. Then a young Italian travels to the capital, bringing a strange invention with him. Guglielmo Marconi is nervous. It's the first public presentation of his invention. He doesn't want to reveal too much for fear of plagiarism. He puts his self-made device inside a box to hide it from the prying eyes of the spectators. Using electromagnetic waves, he causes a bell on the box to ring, without the use of any wires whatsoever. 
He claims that his waves can cover enormous distances. As Marconi wanders around the hall with the receiver, it becomes clear to everyone that they're witnessing an amazing breakthrough. The news spreads like wildfire, and Marconi becomes famous overnight. In those days, ships could only exchange information visually, such as by using flag signals. But ships on the open sea, as opposed to those near the coast, are totally isolated, and no one can be called for help if they encounter difficulties. Marconi aims to change this with the help of his invention. Marconi continues his experiments in London, inspired by attempts made by the German Heinrich Hertz. And sure enough, he finally manages to transmit a signal over several hundred meters with his transmitter and receiver. Now he's ready to register the patent for his invention in London. He taps the signals using a Morse key. An induction coil creates a high voltage and charges two metal balls at the ends of the wire. The voltage increases until a spark discharges and the magical wave is released into the room. But in order to reach ships, the electromagnetic waves must be able to travel over water. Marconi was to attempt something that had never been done before at the Bristol Channel between Lavernock Point and Flathome Island. His assistant, George Kemp, had been on the island with the receiver for several days. But so far, they've had no success. None of the signals will travel over the water. Marconi decides to extend the antenna and make a new attempt. The wave train races to the island at the speed of light, and shortly after, the message returns successfully. Five kilometers, a new world record. The 13th of May, 1897, was a day that would go down in history. In July, Marconi finally received his patent papers. This guarantees him priority in the wireless transmission of electrical pulses. A short time later, he signed a groundbreaking contract. Marconi had been in negotiations with business partners of his British family for some time. That same month, this consortium of whiskey barons and businessmen founded the Wireless Telegraph and Signal Company, a company devoted to wireless telegraphy. Marconi received 15,000 pounds for his patent, about 1.2 million euros in today's terms, plus 60% of the shares and 25,000 pounds for further development of his technology. Within six months, the value of his shares had trebled. At just 23 years of age, Marconi was not just famous, he was an unbelievably wealthy man. 